You've been lied to, but you don't know how. You've searched, you've struggled, you've cried out. You want the truth, but where is it? You've wandered, you've fought, you've strived, and you have not been satisfied. What is truth? Where is truth? Who is truth? The kingdom of God. Mind control. The last days. Higher dimensions. Unity. The power of faith. Discovering the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. God has promised that he will hide us under his feathers and under his wings we will trust. His truth shall be our shield and our buckler. Discovering the Truth with Dan DeVall is the premier program that is designed to center you on the kingdom of God to equip you with faith in Jesus Christ and to unveil the truth behind the lies. This program is designed to show you how to become more than you have ever imagined through the power of truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And now, prepare for your host, Dan Duvall. You're listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. This show is designed to center you on the kingdom of God, to equip you with faith in Jesus Christ, and to unveil the truth behind the lies. This program is a production of Bride Ministries, and you can find us at www.bridemovement.com. Folks, I am very excited because today we are going to answer a question. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul makes reference to something called the doctrines of demons. But in context, we have very little reference as to what was actually being talked about. We don't know what the doctrines of demons are. That is, until today. Because in this program, I will have a gentleman who tells me, Daniel, I have... The entire list of the 28 doctrines of demons, and I am ready to expose them all. Folks, before we get to him, I want to take a minute to talk about a number of points because we are moving in directions that are very exciting. Here's the overview. Discipleship is an ongoing agenda for Bride Ministries. I'm adding people every week to our waiting list. And if you want to get on board with this, you can contact us through www.bridemovement.com. Discipleship is an internet-based experience designed to work like a small group based on the technology of Google Hangouts. We have face-to-face discussions based around study materials. We we, we are preparing and, and, and putting together. There is four separate series. The first is entitled Grace. The second is called In Christ. The third is The Kingdom. And the fourth will be Spiritual Warfare. We are trying to graduate people into a more equipped and empowered approach to Christianity. And if, number two, if you haven't gotten your hands on the book Kingdom Government and the Promise of Sheep Nations, that's my newest book, Go ahead and get it. Folks, I have a book right on the heels of Kingdom Government and the Promise of Sheep Nations, and it will be called Higher Dimensions, Parallel Dimensions, and the Spirit Realm. Now, it is finished. I am looking at Kingdom Government and the Promise of Sheep Nations, and once enough copies of that book have sold to cover my personal costs in publishing it, I will be releasing Higher Dimensions, Parallel Dimensions, and the Spirit Realm. So look forward to that later this year. We are moving forward on our plans to break into media. We have finished the second draft of the script. We are now preparing to begin casting and securing locations to film. Praise God. I have been saying 
over and over again. We are looking to underwrite the cost of helping individuals that have suffered from dissociative identity disorder because of mind control agendas. As of this week, we are financing the cost of helping three. Now, if you remember last week, I said we were financing the cost of helping two. And the week before that, I said we were financing the cost of helping one. Folks, this is is moving forward it is happening it is unfolding before our eyes and it is made possible by those of you that are partnering with us financially believe it or not we are already beginning to move into a waitlist scenario but god will provide as i've said from the beginning the kingdom is already underwritten this vision and we are going to move forward in order to move forward we have defined a three-phase plan the first phase which is the phase we are in is to create a community of coaches that are able to work with people through the inner healing the deliverance necessary to overcome dissociative identity disorder in the second phase we want to build a facility to house those and to keep those safe that one cannot afford their own help but two are in unstable circumstances uh and 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 finally in the third phase once we have an operational paradigm that works protocols that work ways of making this functional we want to reproduce the effort around the world in the process we're going to be training equipping and releasing people that are able to do this ministry folks It is exciting. It is happening. And I want to give a special thank you to every person that is jumping on board with us financially to push us forward. On the subject of our financial partners, I want to make a comment. Now, years ago, when this ministry was a tiny infant baby, I mean, we're still in the baby phase, really, but uh, we were even more baby-ish back then. I used to do this thing where I, I would get you know, two or three donations a month on a good month. And, and I would, um, make separate word documents for each and every person that contributed and send those off in an email, say, thank you so much from Bride Ministries for your giving. This is the giving. This is the date. This is all, all this information. I would take the time to create a separate word document receipt for each and every person. <laughs> I, I didn't have any, you know, financial tools, QuickBooks or anything like that to automate this for me. And so that's what I did. And some of you may remember that. At this point, praise God, we are having more people partner with us than ever before. Things are growing. And I do not have a staff yet. We are in that point, that that place in time where things are moving forward in, in, in enough growth that we are looking at getting a staff or a secretary at some point in the future to handle some of the tasks I wish I had time to do, but we're not quite there yet. So I simply want to address the subject of receipts. When it comes to financial contributions, most of you are donating through PayPal and I want to thank you for that. That is awesome. PayPal sends a receipt. Right now, that is functioning as our receipt. Um, We are not automating or creating documents that show receipts for every gift that is coming in at this point because, I, I, frankly, I just don't have a system for doing that and I don't have the time to do what I used to do. But as we move into the future as we are able to grow and build in and incorporate systems, have people that handle this part of what we do, we will begin to build some of those really cool things, nice things, you know, it's always nice to get a personalized receipt um, when you do make a financial contribution. So we want to build some of those things back in, but for now we simply can't. So so bear with us, but if you are contributing financially and at any point during the year, because at the end of the year we will be giving every financial contributor a statement. Um, during the year, if you have questions or you want to see a statement or a record of our log, the giving that you have made, just send an email and ask because I will do that. I'll make sure you get that. Um, And I am just so thankful and I'm praising God for each and every one of you that are linking arms with us in this way. Now, I want 
to remind everyone also that who I, I brought this up once. Now I'm going to bring it up again. We are brainstorming, okay, and considering creating an interactive internet-based church service. The idea would be to produce a worship recording uh, so it's professional. It's not live and sounding really bad with all kinds of acoustic problems, uh, but to, to create that and, and then we create a nice worship experience that you can engage in at your house with family, friends that may want to come over and, and, and enjoy this with you. After that, a 30 to 40 minute sermon followed by, and here's the revolutionary part, a breaking up of the entire internet congregation into discussion groups to dialogue in real time with people all over the world after the sermon about the word of God and about what God is doing. It would be a revolutionary internet-based approach to a house church model of doing church. And we're brainstorming it. We, we're throwing ideas out there, me and one of my board members. And with technologies like Google Hangouts, it is entirely possible to do this. And it frankly wouldn't cost, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars to put this together. You know, we, we could do this at least initial launch at a relatively moderate cost. So we're looking at it. And if you have any thoughts, ideas, suggestions along these lines, folks, like I'm saying, we're in brainstorming phase right now. Go on and send them to us. I'd, I'd love to get some of your input and insights. Maybe you are the prophetic word of the Lord to us to say, you know, well, this is something that would really work well along those lines. Um, so, the last point I want to bring up is that it is part of our vision to underwrite ministry efforts ultimately with profits from real business. Folks, uh, this thing is bigger than uh, me. It's bigger than Bride Ministries as an organization, and it is all about producing the vision. And so we are going to branch out and leverage every tool available that God avails to us in order to accomplish the vision. And of course, my vision is to promote unity in the body of Christ worldwide and assist in the creation and development of sheep nations. Enough said. Without further ado, we are going to go to a brief break. And when we come back, we are going to expose the doctrines of demons in this epic episode of Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. says in 1st Timothy 4 1 now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons when we read this passage it becomes clear that the doctrines of demons do exist however we're not given any further details as to what these doctrines actually are what are the doctrine of demons? For a long time, I had no idea until I came across a book called Magus Therona, High Priest of Satan in South Africa. This book detailed the testimony of a man named Phil Botha, a high-ranking satanic priest in South Africa that escaped the power of the cult by the power and intervention of Jesus Christ. At the end of the book, some of the doctrines of demons were disclosed, and others were not. 
I immediately contacted the author of the book in an attempt to get the rest of the list. And now, nearly a year later, I have the author of Phil Botha's biography on the line with me. And for the first time that I'm aware of, we will be publicly disclosing the entire list of the 28 doctrines of demons as understood by the late Phil Botha. Francis is a minister in South Africa. He is the author of Magus Therona, High Priest of Satan in South Africa, which is available at Amazon.com. And he is also the author of an upcoming book on the very subject we're going to be discussing right here, namely, The 28 Doctrines of Demons. Francis, it is a pleasure to have you on Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. Thank you very, very much. I count it a great honor and a privilege sharing this on behalf of Phil Boerter as well as for the kingdom of God. Because, as you mentioned, the body of Christ needs to hear what the 28 doctrines are. Because when Paul shared that with Timothy, he was predicting and he prophesied that there will be a falling away of the Christian faith. And it will be solely responsible to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, Francis, in order to introduce this program and how you came to have in your possession the 28 doctrines of demons, I want to get started by having you tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to meet Phil Botha. Okay. Um, It is a pseudonym, Francis B., but it is also two names within my British three names that I was given. Mm -hmm. But we're leaving it for that. So I'm Francis B. and I live in South Africa for the last 61 years. I was born there of British parents. I became a full-time missionary after Jesus Christ saved me beautifully on the 30th of March 1973. Led to the Lord by a wonderful American missionary, Uncle Dick Morgan, who has fallen asleep in Jesus. And I came back to Cape Town and I got saved while I was in army training up in Joburg with the missionaries, came down to Cape Town. And in 1974, I was called into the full-time ministry as a missionary to bring teenagers and parents together to unite them. And it was there in 74 that I met Fulwater. He had just left Johannesburg and came down to Cape Town to minister to the whole of the Western Cape. Hmm. And we ministered together Uh, in about a dozen churches because we don't know why but high priests in Satanism are never allowed to drive cars they are always driven to every meeting to every sanctuary and temple so I had to drive full to a few high schools where he shared his testimony and to a few churches as well it was very strange but we just carried on with it and Phil shared his life story with me and then he he knew that I was a recording artist, a gospel recording artist, and he asked if I would record and narrate his true life story. But him being Afrikaans, he said, would I mind doing the voiceover, doing the whole narration, because I speak English pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I did it, and I had to rewrite his entire autobiography then, when he was alive. And so we did that. He liked it very much. And we sent out the cassettes to a couple of hundred people for free. We didn't charge them a cent. And in it, I learned that Phil Bertha is the only Magus High Priest of Satanism ever in the world who escaped alive and converted to Christianity. And within the first two years of his ministry, over 2,000 professional witches that used to slave under him in Satanism, came out and were led to the Lord by Fulberta in different churches. And the Holy Spirit made one stipulation because of who they were. Within a half an hour of them being born again, they had to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit to seal them completely from the enemy. Hmm. Now, you just you you published a book detailing this testimony of Phil Botha, who became the high priest of Satan in South Africa on what is detailed as the left hand path. 
Now, yes. can you spend a few minutes detailing what the left-hand path is and what convinced you that Phil Botha was the real deal? Well, he's the only person that I've ever seen uh, in 40 years of full-time ministry where he ministered to 150-odd Afrikaans people in the Stellenbosch University of Cape Town, mm -hmm. and he shared maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when he prayed for them, 88 of them were baptized in the Holy Spirit spontaneously, instantly, and there was chaos in the whole campus of Stellenbosch because uh, Stellenbosch is governed by the Dutch Reformed Church, which is primarily Calvinism. Mm -hmm. So they're ex exclusively to God, and everybody who becomes a Dutch Reformed Church member will obviously have eternal life. It's one of those sections. Mm -hmm. And when, when the ministers heard that 88 of their congregation members were speaking in tongues <laughs> and they were really carrying on, the very next morning, within 12 hours of Phil's meeting, they had four dominis, which a dominie is an Afrikaans word for minister or pastor. And they had four of these dominis with chairs over the campus, and they tried to indoctrinate the children that if you speak in tongues, if you were baptized in the Holy Spirit by this full word coming out of Satanism last night, you will be excommunicated from the Dutch Reformed Church. Oh, gosh. And wonderfully, 10 and then 20 and then about 30 students stood up weeping before the Lord saying, are we going to be excommunicated now? We speak in tongues. We didn't know. We just have a new kind of life in Jesus. How can you kick us out? And within five minutes, they closed up their books, satchels, and off they went. And that was the end we ever heard of them. Hmm. Now, um, Coming back to the left-hand path, what Oops. does this mean for Satanists, for cult members, uh, for the high degrees of the Luciferian allegiances in the world? Okay. Uh, sorry about that, Daniel. I got sidetracked, but this is how the Holy Spirit works, so don't fence me in. <laughs> okay, that's no problem. <laughs> Sa Satanists do not like to be called Satanists. Okay. They prefer left-hand path. That's that's where they're at. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, an equivalent to comparison would be uh, members in the movement, members of the left-hand path or Satanists, never ever refer to themselves as devil worshippers. Because, and this is a real Anton LaVey hoax all the way to the bank. There are no such thing in Satanism. Outside there are, in different cults, but in real bona fide Satanism, there are no devil worshippers. Fulbwerter was entrapped, enslaved in true Satanism for 17 years. He never, ever saw the devil personally in front of him, hmm. ever. Now, Francis, you are looking to create a movie about Phil Botha's testimony. What would you like to tell our audience about that? Yes, we are. Um, I had the amazing honor of meeting South Africa's best Christian film producer, Richard Vandenberg. And once he had read Magus, he said, Francis, I have been waiting many, many years for a real, real, true life Christian story. And this is it. And at the first meeting we had, he agreed instantly that he would turn it into a two-hour, full-feature Christian movie. But he made a brilliant remark. He said, I'm not going to make one of these cheesy Christian movies with little bits of flame and low budget. He said, I want it to be like Ben-Hur or the Ten Commandments were. And in comparison, we're looking at Gladiator. He wants to make something as good quality-wise as Gladiator was. Because um, we're looking at 15 million rand. I think in dollars it would be one point something million, which is next to nothing. But in South Africa, 15 million, it's a big number. So we are trusting the Lord and we are trusting the Holy Spirit to touch many, many wealthy Christian businessmen. Once they have read the book, 
that they can actually visualize Phil Boerter's life story, Magus, on the big screen, being shown in so many cinemas around the world and in 11 different languages. This is what we are aiming at. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what, after reading the book and uh, seeing some of the things brought up in his testimony, like satanic zombies, beings that are very beautiful and seven feet tall with six fingers and six toes walking around some of the satanic temples, uh, some of the things that are actually done by these people that are kept in great veils or behind great veils of secrecy. I would be really excited to see a movie that portrays this in a way that glorifies God and the same Savior that brought Phil out of that lifestyle. So yes. I'm really excited about that. Um, and I pray that you guys are successful in connecting with and that you have divine appointments with those people that can finance or underwrite the cost of producing this. I know I have personally a, a really big heart towards getting into media and even me and one of my board members now are, are working on a script and we are moving forward on trying to create begin to create media because this is a mm. this is a huge huge I mean tool for reaching people that simply aren't planning on stepping into a church next Sunday. So okay Let's come back now yes. and talk about the 28 doctrines of demons. Now, how did Phil, as the high priest, receive the 28 doctrines of demons? In his biography, he shares there that his spirit guide, Thorana, used to trick him into doing certain things, bringing pandemonium or even sickness, as he once drank the glass he thought of water, and he actually lost his voice, went to a normal doctor, specialist, and the doctor said, your larynx and other parts have gone, you will never be able to speak again. And Thorana said to him, if you will let me take possession of your body for a certain amount of hours per day, per week, per month, I will give you voice back. And within a second, when he placed his hand on Phil's body, his voice came back perfectly. So Thorana inhabited Phil's body. How did Therona begin to teach Phil? I assume that's what happened then, as Therona came into Phil Botha's life yes, through this I deception was. and yeah. invitation. He is the one then that taught Phil the 28 doctrines? That's right. Mm. It was one evening, um, I think it was also on the 13th or 14th of February, which is the mass that they have, Black Mass. Mm -hmm. And he possessed Phil's body and he started teaching Hinduism, astrology, fortune telling, reincarnation to the members in the Satanic Temple at the time. And I think it went on for about four and a half hours. And he left Phil's body. Phil was, of course, exhausted after the event, but he knew nothing about it. And Phil shared with me afterwards. He was walking down the road one or two days later and people would come up to him and say, oh, thank you so much for that excellent teaching on reincarnation. It was amazing. Where did you get this information from? And Phil looked at them like they were crazy because he didn't even recognize them. And he had no knowledge of being taught or even teaching reincarnation. And then Thorana explained, when you are demon possessed and you are really not in control of your body, soul, or spirit. The enemy, the demon, will say things and do things and come out of your body, and you will not remember a single thing. And that's what we have been stopping in South Africa. We have had young people who have actually set two teenagers alight and burnt them to death and claimed that it was Satan that told them to do it, or they were possessed by a demon to do that. And we have proven nicely and carefully to the police and to hopefully the magistrates in future that when a so-called teenager or any young adult is demon-possessed, they do not go out and murder someone and then give you a full account of how they did it. Because if you're possessed, it is exactly like being hypnotized. You have no concept or idea of what you did 
for that last or 15 minutes. So then as Phil was getting the information based on the doctrines, apparently he was teaching, not him, but the Rona in his body. Yes. Did he begin to document these? He did, because this is also part of the reason that Phil had to study these hmm. doctrines of devils in order to become Magus. So that was at the early stage of his uh, teaching here to, I think it was six or seven days a week for 10 solid years. That's why these people who pop up out of the woodwork and say, well, I was a high priest for so long, and we normally openly challenge them in front of the pastors and say, how did you study? How long did you study for? Oh, we didn't study. I was just nominated by the whole of the temple, and they said, you must be high priest. And that's also, which I put in Doctrines of Devils, the book, that is also the proclamation of the well-known past Anton de Vey. He never, ever entered a satanic temple. Hmm. You read every biography you can or account of Anton de Vey, just quickly in a nutshell, just for those who are going to listen carefully. He had been doing courses, classes. He was getting about 10 or 20 people in his father's home, which he rented, and he would teach them once a week occult, this and that. And one evening when they left, he was walking down the passage, and this comes from the words of his publicist. He was walking down the passage and said, I'm going to be the high priest of the Church of Satan of America. Within 24 hours, his publicist went to the media and said to them, this is what Anton LeVay has just said. What do you think we should do? They told the publicist, tell him to write a book and to get it out into the media and we will cover it, and then things will happen. Otherwise, we're not interested in him. So he took three of the best and well-known books of the occult, and he committed plagiarism. He stole sentences and sometimes entire paragraphs from three of the best-known then authors on the occult. And that is the true story of how the Satanic Bible actually came about. And to put the cherry on the top, Daniel, hmm. when I mentioned this, the first time I ever mentioned it to Phil Buerta, he laughed in my face. He says, we have never, ever opened that book in Satanism because Anton LaVey is the biggest con artist you can find. And he said to me, Anton LaVey has never levitated. He has never astral projected. And he certainly hasn't done anything else. He's never been to a temple because basically... Everybody in America and around the world who has paid $200 for their special crimson card that says, I am a member of the Church of Satan of America. They have never been initiated into anything. They've never attended a, a single temple or sanctuary because physically there is no Church of Satan in America. It's a hoax. Hmm. Now... I have several reports of people that were involved in Anton LaVey's path of destruction. <laughs> uh, Nicely put. That, that well, uh, confirmed that he was definitely working with some cult powers. But I definitely agree that the Church of Satan in America, as an organization, isn't anything serious in the occult world and um i think that's actually a good thing <laughs> because yes you know very, very. um that's a public way i think people think they're going to get involved in something deep and uh well apparently it's not you know from reading your book i mean it seems like phil botha who by the way folks is now deceased which is why we're talking with his biographer today um it seems like his story, to me, seemed very genuine. So I want now to get into these teachings that Therona delivered to Phil. And the first on the list of the 28 doctrines of demons is astrology. Can you tell us about that? Okay. Uh, basically, astrology would be to place your trust or to be curious or even to have a little bit of faith on the weekly or monthly newspapers that you get 
to look for the stars foretell and then to believe that mere star signs that you were born under could literally detect and determine most of your characteristics or your personality, your attributes, and even your future. Hmm. The second on the list is fortune telling. Tell us about that. Fortune telling, as you know, Daniel, can be done in many, many ways. And in South Africa, it's a weird way. Mm -hmm. I'll come to that in a minute. They call bone throwers. They literally throw dirty old bones. Yuck. But fortune, fortune telling would be to have a person reading your palm or teacup reading. You would have a cup of tea with them. And how your tea leaves fall in the cup around the sides, that is how they determine your future. Hmm. But unfortunately for the fortune tellers, they went bankrupt because when they introduced tea bags, they lost their job. Then you get tarot cards and you get the African bone throwing. Now, these are normally witch doctors or some gomas. Mm -hmm. So the African bone thrower would take little bits of sand, small pebbles and bones, sometimes teeth from animals and we know from human beings. And they would shuffle it in their hands like dice and throw it on the floor. And how the bones fell, that is how your future is determined. And then we get, as you would obviously know, it happens in America and every other country, the crystal ball reading, clairvoyance, and especially the Ouija board, hmm. uh, better known to most of South African teenagers, we call it glassy glassy. The Americans would call it glassy glassy. <laughs> and unfortunately, the glass or the glass does move. You can put a plastic container over there that will also move because if it is done correctly, which shouldn't be done, mm -hmm. the glass will move by the spirit. And again, everything is done. This is why it is so bad. And this is why fortune telling is not Satanism. It is just part of the occult. Why? Because you are trying to tell your fortune like Nimrod tried without bothering to trust or ask God for his perfect plan for your future. That is why it's part of the occult. Because they are doing things without the knowledge, without the power of God, who he alone knows your perfect future. Hmm. The third on the list, uh, you actually listed the Ouija board as separate from fortune telling. Just so that those listening uh, follow me. <laughs> it's a, uh, Yes. If you don't mind, could I just mention a fraction of Ouija board? Yes. Okay. Daniel, the reason why, and I hope she's not listening. Um, when I became a Christian, mm -hmm. my first Christian girlfriend up in Johannesburg was a Nazarene American girl. She was stunning, blonde and all. Mm -hmm. And when I left Johannesburg after my army training was finished, I went back to Cape Town, my hometown, and when she heard, we used to keep on writing, when she heard that I had my first girlfriend down in Cape Town, she actually took her Ouija board from under her bed. And she tried to move the glass and place a curse upon our relationship. Oh, and wow. we did. And we did break up a week later. But the ironic thing and the sad thing is, she had a father who was then the superintendent of all the Nazarene churches of South Africa. And she had a Ouija board under her bed. That's why this doctrines of devils must get out so the body of Christ can be warned. Just as it is so bad for Pentecostal pastors' wives who teach yoga in the church hall because there's nothing wrong with body language and getting a slimmer body, it is just as bad for a superintendent of a certain denomination over a certain country or area for his daughter to be so far from God that she actually has a Ouija board under her bed to use when things don't go her way. 
I think it's very interesting then that now this makes sense that you're suggesting a Ouija board can be used to tell fortunes or to receive a communication from a spirit. But then there are individuals that will use the Ouija board in order to send a curse. Yes, if they know what to do, they will try it, Daniel. But what every, uh, even Christians as well as unbelievers who use the Ouija board, hmm. Christians need to know at, at, at the start of the program, as you mentioned very clearly, the falling away with seducing of spirits and doctrines of devils, the minute, hypothetically, the minute Daniel plays Ouija board as a Christian, whether he knows about it or it's in ignorance, his spiritual hedge of protection is broken. Hmm. And when he had, before he played Ouija board, he had a guardian angel that would protect, guide, and guard him through thick and thin, through snow and rain. The minute his spiritual hedge is broken from attending or partaking in Ouija board, his guardian angel is retracted. He's moved to one side and he doesn't have the power anymore to protect Daniel 100% like he used to. His power drops hypothetically to 50%. You need to renounce that one Ouija board, that one term, renounce it to Jesus Christ, ask for forgiveness, and instantly your spiritual hedge will be renewed. That is how dangerous any of the occult or the 28 doctrines really, really is. Amen. Okay, the next one on the list is, in fact, yoga, which you briefly mentioned already. Tell us about that. Yoga, I have a little bit of experience. When the Beatles went to India, I couldn't afford to join them because I was a Beatle fanatic. I went to the local bookstore and bought everything on Hare Krishna, Shiva, yoga, and I followed yoga. And unfortunately, I didn't know at the time how bad it was. Only when I met Phil Buerta did he enlighten me. Now, again, please listen very carefully, Christians. I was born again in 74, 73. I was baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit in 74. I was a full-time missionary, but my spiritual hedge was broken hmm. because I didn't know that astral projection, which I did, levitation, which I was a part of, and especially yoga and TM. I had done all of those things as a wild teenager. I didn't know my spiritual hedge was broken. So Phil shared with me that yoga is its a crucial part of Hinduism. In the Sanskrit word yoga, it means to yoke yourself with, not God, but one of the divine deities of Hinduism. And if you know anything about Hinduism, they have over one or two million gods because that's why they don't kill cows or dogs or anything that has life. You will see uh, priests or yogis actually bowing down to a cow walking through the streets. And when, this is literal now, when it drops down in the streets, the swamis and the yogis will bow to what it has just dropped. These are the so-called divine deities of Hinduism. So you get people like beings, man-made beings like Krishna, Shiva, Vishnu, or Brahman. And these are just exercises, and every exercise or position of yoga that you do, the correct positions, full shed, that these are positions of prayer to the Hindu gods. And when you are, they don't do it today so much, but when the Americans went over and followed the Maharishi with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. When the Americans went over, the majority of them, they were given a mantra. And a mantra is a special name of a Hindu demon. And you are instructed and commanded not to tell anybody, not even your wife, what your mantra is, because everyone gets a different one. And chant this mantra over and over and over as a position of prayer to one of the gods and his yoga it is such a dangerous thing to get into all right <laughs> well stated um the next item on the list of the 28 doctrines of demons is reincarnation what is that 
Okay. Um, reincarnation is again one of those different cases where Thorana used to boast. And Full came to him one day and said, Thorana, I have a problem. I know certain things that happened many years ago. Mm-hmm. And I actually went to history books and I saw the people. I read their names and I was there. And Thorana burst out laughing. He said, no, let me explain to you. He said, all of these little Indian girls, which we teach, all the Indian girls in uh, India, Calcutta, they say they know somebody because they came from them. And this one did this and they give the name and actually the street or the house or the suburb where they were. And they would tell you exactly what the person said. And the girl didn't get that from her previous life. Those were demons that had been possessing those famous people. And when they came out of those people, they carried on possessing people as they died, new ones came along, and suddenly the girl came along, this little girl that had so much knowledge of her previous life. And she was possessed by the same spirit that possessed the person that she says that she was in her previous life. So there's there's no such thing as coming back, as being reincarnated. Because this is, again, Daniel, this is one of the cliches, but also one of the tricks of the trade. Mm -hmm. All of the 28 doctrines of devils were created specifically by demons, evil spirits, and spirit guides. And they infiltrated the brains of evil people. And that's why the yogis and the swamis and all of these gurus, they have been given these doctrines And now they have formed a religion of Hinduism. Mm. And this is how the this is how the whole thing comes about. So when when they get ideas of I know what Napoleon was, I know that he went to that shore and he met that person. I was there. I, I must be Napoleon. No, you're not. You were just possessed by the same spirit that possessed certain people in that time. Well, and, you know, it was when I was reading the book and I, I came across that comment that I I think that really resonated with me. I, it made a lot of sense to say, aha, the demons that were there pull back real memories from events in the past and can interface with people and almost create a copy of those real memories in the person to make them believe that they, right. in fact, had a past life, when in reality, it's the art of deception. So I think that, uh, personally, I was like, yes, uh, praise God for that explanation, because it makes sense. Um, karate Zen, that's the next doctrine of demons on your list. What is? How does that find its way onto the doctrine of demons? Why aren't we just to understand karate as a form of self-defense? I would say judo is self-defense. With karate, if you learn correctly, karate is there to maim and hurt and to harm the people. With one finger, one blow, in one position, you can kill a person. That's not self-defense. Self-defense doesn't kill people. Could you imagine if Jesus knew karate and taught all of his 12 apostles? He would never have been crucified. You and I would never be saved. End of story. Karate Zen is to surrender yourself to Zen Buddha. Now, the little children that go on the mat, the dojos, and they do all of the stuff that they do, and they go into tournaments, and they get black belts, green belts, blue belts, that's fine. Hmm. But the danger lies when these children go further, and they start going into meditation. That's why it's called Karate Zen. See. Now, with full, there is, there is no reason why a converted ex-high priest of Satan, spiritful, would even bother to lie about studying for 10 years, taking up karate, knowing, and I'm getting goosebumps right now, knowing that 25 of the original styles, not the hogwash that you see in Hollywood, mm-hmm. but 25 of the original styles of karate were named after Lama Tibetan monks. Interesting. And if you go, I shouldn't say this, but if they go onto YouTube 
you can actually see there's a very well-known Lama Tibetan monk at the moment fighting different styles against karate champions, and the karate champions are coming off second. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, next on the list is astral projection. Why don't you spend some time talking about this one? Astral projection would be the ability to command or force your spirit out of your body, and it is, um, let me say, it is vital on all three levels of transcendental meditation, because genuine TM, transcendental, just to make sure, Mm -hmm. genuine TM practitioners will confirm that when you leave your body, there is that thin silver cord, and it can be seen floating effortlessly. If you've seen the Sandra Bullock movie, the recent one, Gravity, the same thing applies. It is almost as if an astronaut's shoelace was allowed to float within the capsule void of any and all gravity. And I, when I heard this first, I thought, Phil, you've got to be joking, because I was typing this out mm-hmm. for him. I said, thin silver cord. And he looked at me and he said, you got a Bible, check it out. Don't believe what I say, double check it. And I did. And I found that in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 6 and 7, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain. And this speaks, it is the only verse that speaks of the silver cord to be loosed and full shared with us, coming from Satanism. When they, um, in the book of Magus, you'd have to read it, this is me canvassing, but there is a witch that tried to expose Satanism and they drugged her and before they put her to death, but they didn't put her to death, they found out something and Phil saw that when she eventually was put to death in a certain way, her spirit, the silver cord, was severed Mm. and she died and so if you commit suicide willingly knowingly or if you pass away through sickness your silver cord is loosed and broken and only then can your two guardian angels come and usher you into heaven or the angels of death also two of them will usher you into hell whether you believe it or not that is and when the silver cord will be loosed So astral projection is a definite no-no because when I was 15 and a half, 16, I only tried it once, listening to Beatle music, and I was meditating, believe it or not, Daniel, three and a half solid, stupid hours on a dot on the wall. I was meditating on nothing. That's what they said. I didn't have a mantra because I couldn't get to India with the Beatles. But my body sat there, and within the three and a half hours, I just looked down and I saw myself sitting in that ridiculous position, lotus position, and I was meditating with this um, and I got such a fright, I shot back into my body, I ran out of the house to go tell my friends, and I have never, ever, ever tried that again, because there's one verse that I think, personally now, there's one verse that I think applies to that, what will a man gain? If he loses his soul and he gains, or his spirit gains, the entire world. Because when you can astral project correctly and properly, your spirit leaves your body and you can go into the next room or the next house or the next street. That is why it was such a wow for all the Americans who went over to India and did TM and astral projection. They couldn't wait to levitate off the floor. Thank you for that. And uh, that's that's absolutely uh, true. And this this reference to the silver cord, it, it does happen to be the only one in the Bible, but that testimony collaborates with other things that I have read and heard. And to find out that astral projection is, in fact, one of the 28 doctrines of demons comes as no surprise to me. So uh, <laughs> the next mm, on the mm, list... Right is luck charms. What are those? Okay, lucky charms. um, I don't understand why people do this or believe in it, but it's their bag, basically. Mm -hmm. 
It is to trust or believe or to have a little bit of faith in an ornament or a statue. Okay. We had a we had a mayor in Cape Town about I think seven eight years ago, and when you walked into his office, you were compelled to rub the belly of the Buddha standing at the door, and only then could you get your contract signed. Bent coins, animal parts like the rabbit's foot or a piece of clothing, a doll. And this is supposed to be, most of the time, it's supposed to ward off all bad omens and maybe even avoid all accidents. One of the things is St. Christopher. That is a problem. People used to have St. Christopher, put it on their dashboard around their neck. And then I found out, and unfortunately I don't have it with me tonight, but I found out, Daniel, that the Pope himself, head of the Roman Catholic Church, maybe, I stand under correction, but maybe 10 to 15 years ago, made a proclamation. They have done research, and there is no such person that ever lived as St. Christopher. And that came from the Pope. So hmm. he's like the Internet. Whatever the Pope says, it's got to be correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was talking with someone about that the other day. All right, so we got luck charms. And the, and I think this would actually maybe even play into what other people have called cursed objects, objects that have yes. had rituals done over them or curses spoken over them things you know yes. to attract certain kind of demonic activity around the object itself and uh, of course embracing that is no good <laughs> islamic right. curses now that's an interesting one to me i didn't see that one coming tell me about that what is an islamic curse that's a weird thing because i'm still trying to put or wrap my head around it because why would Islamic curses want to actually do something like that when the majority are just jihads and they take your life? Why put a curse on you? It takes too long. Hmm. But Islamic curses would be part of black magic because in Satanism there is witchcraft, which is white and black magic. We'll come to that later. But an Islamic curse is black magic. And it is practiced, I say, in the hidden claws of Islam. You don't know about it publicly, but they do it. Normally, which they did to my mother, mm -hmm. and this is part of the reason why she passed away, a very tiny bottle of perfume is normally given to you by a friend or the boss that the Muslim has recently worked for, and you've asked them to leave because you don't like their service. They would come in there and place this bottle tiny bottle at the very back of your clothing drawer or wherever you keep your stuff and this will take an effect on people in the house and it is almost like um, almost like an activated Ouija board hmm. the Islamic curses draws attracts the evil spirit to the house and 99% of the time that I've heard from Phil it is a poltergeist spirit that comes and those as we're going to hear later they are the ones that have the ability and the power to move furniture, kill flowers, right. and your animals, trees, uh, open up doors, break windows. They can do that kind of thing. And this is part of the Islamic curses. Very interesting. And I wonder how much of this goes on in the hidden ranks of ISIS right now. <laughs> yeah, that's a, what a topic. What a topic, you know, especially when you consider that Isis is the name of one of the names of the Queen of Heaven, which is a very, very powerful, uh, I guess we could call it a principality or something interesting. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, sex of mystery and order. Let's talk about that. How do th how does that play into the doctrines of demons? Well, being mystery and being secretive is where Satanism really rests, the heart of it. Okay. And that came from Nimrod when he was killed by, I think it was Shem. Mm -hmm. He was killed by Shem and he was cut up into parts to warn the people never ever to do what Nimrod did ever again because they had just come out of the flood. And so secrets, well, sex of mystery and order with theosophy and Unitarianism and the Rosicrucian, that is where Phil Buter actually landed when he was initiated into Magus, 
He was into Satanism for nine and a fraction years. And when he could qualify and do the most difficult of all occult practices, teleportation, he landed up within three minutes from Johannesburg, South Africa, into America, into the Rosicrucian order. And that's why they are really that bad. And with the other sects would be Buddhism, Freemasonry, as we know, and the Illuminati goes without saying, including the Sufi movement. Wow. All right. So the next one on the list of the 28 doctrines of demons is witchcraft, white and black. Tell us about that. Hmm. This is the part that I find very interesting because the um, I've spoken to a he's passed on now, but I've spoken to a pastor who was involved in white magic. He was a storeman at a uh, clothing store and furniture, and they had the new modern appliances that just come out, all the hi-fi systems back then. And a man walked into the store. And he wanted the best hi-fi system, the loudest, the largest. He wanted it carried on. And he paid in cash. Hmm. And it came to a huge amount. And the pastor took it. He was a part-time pastor then. He took the money, counted it, put in the till, signed everything, waved the guy goodbye. And his chaps took the furniture and the appliances to his home. And lunchtime came and he had to do the books. And he pulled the till slip out and the money had vanished. And within an hour, he was telephoned by the same man who had practiced white magic on him. And he shared with him that he was into Satanism. And he had the ability, after studying, to make magic and to make money appear and to make it disappear again. And that's why um, in Britain, um, where my grandparents came from, there's always been a lot of jokes for hundreds of years about the witches becoming invisible near the black fields of Dartmoor in the UK. And the police could never catch them because they would just become invisible. But I've been checking up in the last four or five years. There are some British magazines that are now printing eyewitness reports of lysanthropy, teleportation, and people becoming invisible. They are walking behind them and they are less than 15 feet ahead of them. They have to pick up something or close their eyes or do something, but their eyes are off the person for less than a second and they have disappeared. And there is no back alley. They are walking in an open field. So I would just leave that open that white magic, it's never to harm people. It's, I wouldn't say to do good, but it is to be deceptive Mm -hmm. in a very nice way, like making love potions, forcing people to fall in love with you, making the talisman, the curses, superstition, even faith healing, which we're going to come to later. All of this is part of white magic. It supposedly makes witchcraft look good. It's like the Freemasons. They will always tell and make it known in the public newspapers Look how much we've given to that charity and look how much we've given to that charity. Aren't we a very, very pompous organization? Okay. Um, So we have a differentiation going on between the white witchcraft and then the black. So I, you know, and and of course we know black means the dark, darker path of witchcraft to do harm, uh, as far as I know, uh, to hurt people things and destroy lives on purpose Mm -hmm. sure Um, and wow um it's in you know bringing up some of the eyewitness reports of the lycanthropy and teleportation i mean well folks here's a hint those are further on down the list so we're going to get more into that with our guest uh the next item on the list you actually list is black magic so why don't you go ahead and just take some time to go more into that okay as you've stated, black magic would be the opposite of white magic. Mm-hmm. And they use curses to harm and destroy their enemies and their bodies. And this is also why, and Christian pastors have argued with me, they said, the devil, Satan, has no power to create. And I say, really? Have you heard of cancer, leukemia, and all the other terminal illnesses that kill people? 
because God didn't create them, who did? And I found out that with Thorunner and with Phil, again, they got him to a position where you get sick and the sickness is created by the enemy. So for the enemy to heal you, there's no effort whatsoever. He just removes what he created. Hmm. And you love, you love him more, you serve him more. Why? Because I had cancer. I had two months to live and I was in Satanism and the devil healed me. And it's 100% correct, but you're just looking at it at the wrong way. So black magic is really dark and really black. And that's why people need to watch out for... Uh, people need to watch out for certain neighbors or friends that you get invited to have lunch or dinner with and you find they have burning incense or Hindu deities or even a statue of Buddha in their homes and always look for the five-pointed star and the eight-pointed star and the crucifix. All of these would be displayed only to mislead backslidden Christians or gullible Roman Catholic members. Right, and I was about to say, you know, it's very interesting that you include the crucifix as you're talking about black magic, particularly because, I mean, isn't that what is displayed in each and every Roman Catholic church you will enter and find <laughs> worldwide? Yeah. Yes, Daniel, it is. And sorry, this is why it's going to be so hysterically funny as well as factual when Richard eventually makes the film of Magus mm -hmm. because we are going to specifically take three minutes and we are going to show what Phil does in his initiation, his first initiation as a mem as a priest. He, he was initiated into the priesthood of Satanism. His first initiation, he is given a crucifix. He has to snap it in half of his rebellion and his hate for Jesus Christ. And these idiots, and I call them idiots because they are serious idiots, they go to movies and they see bad, terrible Hollywood scripts with demon possession and they hold the crucifix and the priest comes and he throws water on them and the more he goes to the crucifix and puts it closer and closer to the man's face, he's foaming at the mouth, his eyes almost popping out. Mm -hmm. There is no power in a crucifix. They hold crucifixes in Satanism. They snap it because it's got nothing. Wow. And I've, on the same thing, Daniel, I've heard people used to tell me, this is when I recently got saved in the 70s, oh, if there's a Satanist that walks into your church, just put a Bible on his lap. He will freak out. He can't touch your Bible. Satanists, read the King James Bible only. They are taught from the King James Bible in satanic temples and sanctuaries and they are taught what the Baptists what the spiritual believers all believe in so they can counteract everything you do and we're going to come to that one at the very end with church visitation hmm. there could be people listening to our voices today they very well could be members of Satan who are who Phil used to specially train and they would infiltrate evangelical not the non-Christian churches, evangelical churches, spiritual churches. They will infiltrate. They would never be seen. They would, placed, they would be placed on committees because they would be so lovable and so likable. They would blend in. And the reason to get on committees is to stop every future priest, preacher, and Bible teacher from teaching this congregation about the rapture, about hell, about sin and about the second coming. Well, and I, I know uh, that the church infiltration occurs, and we've actually um, had a guest in the past talk at length about how they were involved in that as a member of the organization they were a part of. It was a Luciferian organization. I mean, that the agenda to infiltrate church churches is uh, huge and real. So I can't wait to get to the rest of what you have to say about that subject. Next on the list, though, is hypnotism. Tell us about it. Hypnotism is a... <clears throat> Sorry, carry on. 
hypnotism is a very real thing because it happened to me personally, my Christian girlfriend. She was born again and spirit-filled, and she was with me, helping in the ministry. We used to go to services together. I would preach, give the altar call. She would help with counseling. She was really spirit-filled and winning souls. But yet she had been hypnotized once as an unbeliever and twice as a Christian believer. And she never, ever had the zeal or the energy or the desire to study the Word of God. Hmm. And Phil Berta picked this up and he said to me, Alan, you need to speak to her and tell her that her spiritual hedge is broken. And he explained what happens in Satanism and why they taught hypnotism to the people. When you are hypnotized, it is no longer your control. It is a spirit that controls you. And they say that hypnotism is okay because you will never do anything that your nature doesn't really want to do. And that is a lie. Because Diane had absolutely no desire to serve God and study that. She was winning souls. Anybody can do that. But to read the word proves the point. And when I spoke to her on the phone, she confessed and she renounced the sin of hypnotism. Hmm. And within two hours, she was late for work the next morning because she couldn't stop reading the Word of God. She blossomed overnight because hypnotism. She had gone to a guy called Max Colley. I think he's passed away now in South Africa. He hypnotized as an unsaved person. He came back after she was born again and he said, Everybody who has been under my voice before, please stand. And she stood up, sleep. She missed the whole show and she was refunded at afterwards. Then, two and a half years later, as a spiritual Christian, she went back to Max Collie because she likes the meeting, even though she never saw the last one. And he said, ah, it's good to see the faces. Please stand up. Those have been my ministry before that you've heard my voice. Up, up, up. Snaps his finger. Diane went down a second time. That is a spiritual believer serving God, living with the Holy Spirit and Jesus in her heart. She mm. had no control over her bodily functions. He didn't ask her to do anything. She just slept and she missed the whole show and she was refunded afterwards. That's how dangerous hypnotism really is. Never let another spirit, sorry, never let another spirit take control where the Holy Spirit can no longer speak to you and guide you and teach you. Amen. And I think this is one of the very dangerous ones because it's like uh, <laughs> a staple in the psychiatric community's approach to quote unquote helping people deal with their problems. Come into my office. I'm <laughs> certified in hypnotism. <sighs> So I have mental problems and I go a secular route and they are employing a doctrine of demons against mm -hmm. me. And then they put me on a bunch of pills when they realize their hypnotism didn't work. <laughs> that, that's right. And Daniel, sorry, just to, just to close this part of hypnotism, uh -huh. I'm going to go online because it's a very good point. I want to add this into the Doctrines of Devils book that you're bringing up. Some of those girls that we spoke about earlier from India who thought that they were previous lives with reincarnation, two of them were actually hypnotized. And under hypnotism, they came up with the lives and the dates and the names of people. And they were too young because what they stated under hypnotism happened 200 years before they were even born. So I'm going to try and link hypnotism and reincarnation together because it's very, very close. Hmm. Interesting. The next on your list is superstition. What's going on with this one? Oh dear. This is where your listeners are going to switch off because I don't think they're going to be able to handle it. The Christians I'm talking about. Uh -oh. Superstition, it will be due to, let's say the enormous amount of foolish and funny traditions that folks still believe and some participate in 2015. Again, we all know it. Never walk under a ladder. Why? Because you're superstitious. Not something will fall because then it's a case of laws of attraction. You are attracting things into your life. 
We don't walk off a curb. You lose money or you get knocked over by a car. It's all bad luck. That's why the two are very close related. Bad luck, lucky charms, and superstition. You can actually use all three. Now, we were taught as young kids a special song. Step on a crack, break your mother's back. All these silly little things. But then we get older and just listen to some of these. Wearing or carrying amulets to ward off evil spirits, like us in Christopher. One of the enemy's best reversible tactics ever, as most of the amulets or bags or even the medallions and talismans and worry beads. Catholics and Greeks love the worry beads and mm. the Russians. Oh, yes. They, be, they become magnets for visitational periods of spirits. Mm. The incubi and secubi, and of course the evil spirits to secure people. But then again, we get the more intellectuals who, my dad, you drop a fork. Oh, someone's coming to visit. Superstition. And it goes worse because we get people who like to swing a pendulum over a pregnant woman's body so we can detect if it's going to be male or female. And then you get so many other things. Why does a Christian couple or unsaved couple, when they get married, the guy has to carry her over the threshold? Because if he steps on a certain crack, the demon will come for them. Why do Christians... When they get married, they have so many cans at the back of their car to make the noise. That is supposed to be, the noise will keep away the demons. Now, they are innocent, the honeymoon couple. They don't know this. The majority of Christians today don't know of all the superstitious things that they do daily. Hmm. I just find it so, so strange why we do it. And we never, ever stop to research or ask questions. Where does it come from? Okay, now I'm going to ask a question to you uh, that someone's probably going to ask. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Something as quote-unquote innocent as tying some cans to the back of your car when you get married. Now, granted, I didn't do this at my wedding pretty much because I just didn't have, you know, <laughs> I just didn't care. But, <laughs> you know, for those that think, okay, this is going to be nice. You know, I saw it in the movies. They always had the cans in the back of the car. I want cans in the back of my car. So they just take a shoelace, tie cans in the back of their car, get married, drive off cans rattle um does i mean do you think that this opens the door for the devil to actually do something against a person or do you think that something like superstition has to be followed by intent and heart level conviction that the act is going to produce a desired end Mm. um not at all the cans carrying the woman over the threshold it's got nothing to do with the price of eggs Hmm. Literally, because superstition, it's its to get them closer. Look, superstition was created by the enemy to label onto people and to implant in their brains to do certain superstitious things that they would eventually be deeper and deeper and go into the occult. Hmm. So by tying cans doesn't mean a thing. By picking up your wife, whether she's heavy or light, and you carry across the threshold, she's going to love you for it for the rest of your life. Those will not harm you especially my dad, dropping a fork. Uh, Someone's coming to visit. So what do you do then? Make sure you never drop a knife or a fork. That would be be superstitious, Mm -hmm. if you get my point. So those those tiny things that you mentioned hasn't got a clue at all. It doesn't mean a thing. But if it adds on and you start swinging a pendulum over a woman's body, like divination, to see if it's a male or a female, then you're getting closer to white magic and you should actually stay away from that stuff gotcha all right next on the list is faith healing so we're back on this one we brought it up briefly earlier on now as a spirit-filled believer i believe that healing divine healing through the shed blood of jesus christ is part of the atonement I, i really do and i have prayed for people in the name of jesus christ and watched god heal them but there's a counterfeit and It is called faith healing. So let's talk about it. What's going on there? Yes, you actually mentioned the word, the term that carried everything, divine healing. Mm. Divine healing is done by the Lord Jesus Christ through his name or through his blood, the 39 stripes. But faith healing and spirit healing are two of the evils. Now, every one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are imitated terribly 
by the enemy. He -hmm. tries to imitate everything we do. So when we have divine healing in the name of Jesus and people get healed instantly sometimes, he goes one and he says, we are going to create faith healing to confuse the Christians. And we are going to get people who don't really read their Bible and we say, come, you've got cancer, you've got gout or growth or leukemia. We're going to pray for you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Spirit. But they don't say God's only begotten Son and they never mention Holy Spirit, because this in Satanism is the unholy trinity that they pray to. Mm. Now, unfortunately, you will be healed of cancer or leukemia, but this is done, as I mentioned earlier, by demonic forces, which more than likely are the very same evil spirits or instruments of the devil that initiated that cancerous growth or blindness or leukemia in your life in the first place. So the fact that they, the person, can heal you in faith, pray for you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, it sounds Christian, and you suddenly get healed. You will link onto him, like what he's doing, maybe support him or even financially help him out. And you are getting closer and closer to doctrines of devils and the occult by believing something like that. But it is not Jesus. So... When you get healed, when you want to be healed, remember, it's got to be divine healing and the healer, even though he might use a human, the healer must be the Lord Jesus Christ. And most important of all, the Lord Jesus Christ, King of Kings, must get all the glory after the person's healed. Because when a faith healer heals you, Jesus does not get the glory. He does not even get the mention. And Mm. spirit healing is exactly the same, but with a slight deviation. And it's it's weird. I've seen the magazines with the photographs that it's normally a spirit clairvoyant medium. They will see a person, let's say an acute appendix. They will go through the motions of almost making an incision over the affected part of your body. And he will crunch his fist up push into your body and he will remove the desired affected part of that appendix and trust me Phil says that this is genuine he's done it himself or did after he or she goes through the motions of stitching up the open flesh within 10 to 20 minutes of the spiritual healing the patient will be left without any pain There will be no scars on the body and your appendix will be outside in a medical bowl for you to see. Wow. And, you know, I actually read an account by Johanna Michelson where she talked about how she had gone to Mexico and met uh, a, a, a woman who would be possessed by this being that did the spirit healing. And he had these rusty scissors and some kind of thing and he just chop people open Ooh. and I mean just pull stuff out and like they wouldn't feel any pain and sure. then they, they would you know leave actually healed you know it's like how'd you get healed well it's a woman was possessed by a male speaking spirit and he took some rusty scissors and cut me open cut out my bad you mm-hmm. know cancerous stuff right. with scissors I mean like and, and 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 now I'm fine it's like you know that's not right that <laughs> that's weird um but there da- it is. Daniel, mm. sorry, Daniel, may I just end with a short true story that Phil shared with us, uh, shared with the students that I was teaching Bible study at Stellenbosch Varsity. Yes. With spirit healing, I'm so glad that you, you mentioned certain things now because I would have missed it. With spirit healing, not faith, he- uh, sorry, oh, let me change that again. With faith healing, being prayed for in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. When you are finished and you are healed, they also have to give you a very small bag and they demand, they instruct you to wear it around your neck, keep it on your person, even when you shower, hmm. even when you go into the sea. Phil Butter was in a Dutch Reformed church and the moderator, this is the head of the church, he said, Brother Phil, as the Spirit leads. And Phil's ministry, which we need another three hours to share, his ministry was to see the evil in the Christians and help them with the doctrines of devils. 
he walked up to the microphone and he pointed to one of the head pastor's dominis. And he said, you, sir, have come from a faith healer less than two weeks ago. Mm. And on your body, you have a bag. And inside that body, and that's when he walked down from the pulpit towards this dominie who got up and wanted to move away. But the elders stopped him. And he walked up to him and said, open your shirt and take the bag out. And I will prove to you that the bag is a very, very small piece of paper. And it will read something like, I heal you for a season to torment you for all eternity. He says, if you keep this on your body, you will go to hell and spend eternity with the devil. You need to become a Christian right now, commit your life to Jesus Christ and destroy that bag instantly. And they got him, he removed it, and they used the microphone so the congregation could hear. And that was exactly what was written on the piece of paper. That is how extremely dangerous faith healing really, really is. All right, folks. So if somebody tries to get you healed in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and then tries to give you a bag, do not let them pray for you and rebuke them in the name of Jesus <laughs> on your way out. Uh, wow. You know what? We are uh, part of the way into the 28 doctrines of demons, but we are not going to have time to finish this whole list. So what I'm going to do, Francis, is invite you back, and we're going to finish the list in a second program. Before we stop right now, tell our audience if by chance someone heard about your vision to create a movie and wants to get in touch with you, how could they do that? They could email me at Francis underscore B underscore Magus, M-A-G-U-S at yahoo.co.uk I would love to hear from you oh sorry Daniel Mm -hmm. um, just in case people get this mixed up it's with an I Francis the ladies spell Francis with an E the gentlemen spell it F-R-A-N-C-I-S Francis underscore B for baloney underscore Magus at yahoo.co.uk And Magus is M-A-G-U-S. Folks, you have just heard Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. God bless and Godspeed. Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall is the premier radio program designed to center you on the kingdom of God to equip you with faith in Jesus Christ and to unveil the truth behind the lies. This program has been a production of Bride Ministries. You can find us at www.bridemovement.com At our website, you can contact us, access resources, and support us with donations. We need partners in order to continue to produce our vision, which is to promote unity in the body of Christ worldwide and assist in the creation and development of sheep nations. Partner with us and be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Until next time, God bless and Godspeed.